Well, family, I would like to speak to you once more from the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, beginning in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Amen. 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 Let us bow our heads, dear Lord. We thank you for who you are, who you have made yourself known to be. And I ask, Lord, that you would be with us now. May your spirit be poured out in this place. I ask this in your most holy and precious name. Amen. 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 And actually, thinking on that last question, Pastor, there's an even easier answer coming from James chapter 5, 7, 16. 5, 16. For the prayers of the righteous man availeth much. Amen. Amen. So if you are righteous and you pray, I promise the Spirit will work. Amen. Amen. Well, family, we have been studying together, going through the truths of Scripture. And this week, we have seen that God has given His mysteries to us that we might actually participate in the ministry He is working in our hearts. And by the mysteries that He's given us, we actually receive blessings. We've spoken of what those blessings are. We've spoken about how we receive spiritual gifts to aid us on the mission. Last night, we spoke about what might be one of the most disliked truths of Scripture. The fact is that God's law is forever and that God's law is good. I don't know why many people dislike the fact that God's law is good. Maybe it's because they live in fear of the law, but the fact is it is good for those who follow the will of the Lord. It helps us know when we're wrong so that we can see God's goodness. And so tonight, we're going to actually talk and take it a little further and talking about what counts as Christian, Christian morality and responsibility. Because if the law is good and we actually study the law so that we grow in maturity, discerning what is good and evil, then that should actually have an outcome on our lives. We should actually be living righteous, moral lives. And the problem is, what all that entails can often be a very cumbersome discussion. And we've already studied so much and the fact is that some of you might be feeling tired. The fact is, if you're not feeling tired, I can promise you that I am feeling tired. I understand many who are coming in person the first week are now watching from home. Amen. God bless, as long as you're still watching. And we may be feeling tired, but we do need to speak about this issue. We need to speak about Christian ethics. And I know that that is a big topic. It entails everything. How you dress, what you eat, where you go, when you wake up, everything, absolutely everything. In fact, these are the most discussed issues in religion. If you've been to a church, you know we can spend many hours debating even the minute details of how to live life. And these are usually the most heated discussions as well, because everyone has an opinion on Christian ethics and how we should actually live our lives. There's always something to talk about. What is modesty? What actually counts as being modest? What actually counts as doing good? How do you know when you're lazy? The Bible says that laziness is a sin. But how do you know when you're being lazy? No one wants to commit such a sin. And I understand that there's so many discussions that we could have regarding Christian ethics and moral responsibility. But you see, there's something else that we should not lose focus of. The fact is that we've got good news. And I don't want the details to overshadow the good, good news. And you want to know what that good news is? It's that the Spirit bears witness 
with our spirit that we are what? The Spirit actually confirms to us that we are children of God. The good news is that we're part of the family. And that's some very, very, very good news. You are part of the family of God. That's incredible. But you know that families can still have a lot of arguments, a lot of bickering, a lot of issues. But the good news is we are still a part of the family even if we still have a whole lot of issues. And so I think it's actually more important to focus on this, that we are part of the family and discuss what that means to be a part of the family. So I want to speak to you ultimately about where did family come from? Where did we get the concept of family? How does this all begin? And if you've been studying with us, you should already know that the family was founded in perfection. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, and beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created who? And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God gave us the first family. He made male and female in his image and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And I don't think I have to explain to you what that means. Be fruitful and multiply. God created the first family in the Garden of Eden. Let's take a closer look at this family. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and what? Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a what? Fit for him. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a what? And brought her to the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. and They shall become one flesh. You realize that this is one of the mysteries of God? That husband and wife become one flesh. And so you see, family was founded in the garden. And that is some very, very good news. Even before the fall, God had given us the blessing of family. He created the first family. That is good news. Family is something that God himself gave to us. But you see, along with creating the first family, God did more. What did God create the family to do? To have dominion over the what? He created man and put him in the garden so that he might tend and what? Keep it. You see, God gave us the responsibility to steward his what? How do I know that it's his creation? Turn with me to Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell therein. The world belongs to God, and God gave the first family the responsibility to take care of his world. So, that makes us stewards of God's world. What is a steward? A steward is a person entrusted with the management of the household or state of another. We were created to care for God's what? So God established the family, and then He gave them the responsibility to take care of His what? Creation. So, inherent in the family was the design for taking care of creation. Now what does this mean? And this is some other good news that I want you to write down. 
We were created with a what? God created humanity with a purpose. We were designed to actually do something, not just sit around. God gave the first family the responsibility to take care of His creation. We were created with a purpose. And so if you're feeling purposeless, I want you to know one of the truths of Scripture, that God created you for a purpose. And so, I want you to write down what that purpose is. This is one of the first fundamental truths of Scripture. Of scripture. We are God's what? God created the first family in the garden so that they would take care of His creation. We are God's stewards. And the question is, what do we steward? Well, we just read the story together. What do we steward? We steward what? So I'm responsible for literally everything that God has granted in this world. You are held responsible for how you steward God's creation. And that is incredible news that God would still entrust us with such a responsibility. That we were created with such a beautiful purpose that we would actually take care of God's world. But you see, it actually gets better. And I want to show you what I mean. So remember, we were created with a purpose to care for God's world. We are God's stewards, but it gets better than that. I want to show you what I mean. What do we steward? We steward all of creation, but there's more. I want you to look with me at Paul's teaching. What do we actually steward? This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and what? Stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found what? So, is there an expectation of stewards? We were created to be stewards over His creation, but what's more, we are stewards of the mysteries of God. Let's look further. Assuming that you have heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable what? Riches of Christ. Paul is speaking of himself here that they should have heard that he was given stewardship of God's grace so that he could proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you recognize just how vast a responsibility God has placed on his stewards? That we steward the mysteries of God. We have stewardship of God's grace so that we could share and proclaim the riches of Christ. But even as I'm going through the Word of God, I can hear one of the objections in your head. Isn't that just for the pastor? And I think that in almost every Christian church, that is one of the biggest excuses that for some reason, the only person who's actually held responsible is the pastor. As if we're not all God's children, equally created with responsibility to take care and steward His world. I've heard this excuse a number of times, and you've probably heard this excuse before as well. In fact, you may have felt this, this excuse at least once in your life. And you see, I understand, because Paul is speaking of himself, and Paul was a pastor, but I want you to see that Scripture does not let any of you off the hook. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. Use your gifts. I want you to see how this all connects together. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we are going to turn to, I believe, verse 7. It seems I did not go onto the page. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keeping love Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a what? Show hospitality to one another without what? As each has received a what? Use it to serve one another as good what? 
of God's varied graces. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be what? Glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So did you understand what the Apostle Peter has just stated? If you've got a gift, you're a what? If you received a spiritual gift, you are responsible for how you use that gift. You are a steward of God's various graces. You too are a steward of the grace of God if you have received one of God's many gifts. Let's carry on and see further exactly what this means. You see, the word that Paul and Peter use is this, oikonimos, oikonimos. That's literally what the word steward means. We are stewards of what? Remember when I said last week, the church is the what? The theater of God's what? We are the theater of God's grace. We are called to be the stewards of God's grace. So, if you are the stewards of God's grace, living in and participating in the theater of God's grace, what should you be distributing to the world? Amen. I'm glad that I'm making it clear enough to follow along with. So you see that if you have received a spiritual gift, the purpose for which God designed humanity to be stewards of his creation, we are called to be stewards of the gift that God has placed in us. Is it simple enough to follow so far? So now... We have to speak on a steward's character. So God created the first family to be stewards of his creation. We are all called to be stewards of creation. But what's more, that if you've received a spiritual gift, you are a steward of that gift. But I want to show you what should a steward's character look like. Turn with me to Titus chapter 1. For an overseer, as God's what? must be above what? He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he might be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now remember, I said before, pastors are not the only stewards. If you have a gift, you are a what? So if you have a gift, you must too be a steward and you must too be held accountable in this same manner. So what kind of a person should a steward be? A steward should be above what? Is that simple enough to follow? A steward should be above reproach. But I want to look at that list again that Paul has given us. Is that easy to be, not arrogant or quick-tempered or drug, drunkard or violent or greedy. They must be hospitable. How many of you can honestly say that you reflect the character expected of a steward of God? Can you honestly say that you are exhibiting what it means to be a steward of God? So what am I saying through all this? Because you see, Christ himself would actually speak. Jesus told the parable of the steward in Luke chapter 16. And it's a long parable and a very interesting parable. In fact, it's a parable of a dishonest steward, of a crooked steward. And what's interesting is that even though the steward in the parable is dishonest and crooked, the steward is still expected to produce results. And Christ actually is able to teach a truth about the story of a dishonest steward. And so I want to look at what Christ says regarding the parable that he teaches. One who is faithful in a very little is also what? And one who is dishonest in a very little is also what? 
If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Can a steward have divided loyalties? So if you were called to be a steward of God, your loyalty should be to who? Amen. Amen. I'm glad to hear that this church is on the path towards truth. We recognize as stewards of God, our loyalty should be to God. But the fact is, how many of us, if we're honest, will admit that many times our loyalties have been divided? I claim the name of Jesus, but I like to promote my own lifestyle. So, does the actions and character of a steward matter? Yes, the actions and character of a steward matter incredibly so. A steward is expected to exhibit the character of God. A steward is expected to have his loyalties totally directed and only pointed to who? To God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, the actions of a steward matter. And I want you to write down this truth. Our actions show what kind of what? We are. So, if your actions don't show the character of Christ, does that mean that you are Christ's steward? Our actions show what kind of stewards we are. And so if our actions don't display the character of Christ, it tells you what kind of steward you're being. So, here's the basic question. Does it matter how Christians live their lives? So our actions matter. Amen. Amen. So then why don't we actually act like our actions matter? Amen. It's because we're human. But you see, remember how I said at the start that Christian ethics is one of the most broad topics of Christianity. And the reason why we often act like our actions don't matter, it's because we always get distracted by pointless arguments. Remember, my actions are meant to display the fact that I am a steward of God's grace in my life. If you've received a gift of the Spirit, you are a steward of the grace of God working in you. And you should demonstrate that in the way you live your life. Your actions should demonstrate that you are a servant of God. But often, we don't actually demonstrate that because we're actually putting all of our effort into trying to sort out pointless arguments. And how do I know that Christians waste so much time on pointless arguments? It's because we have entire books written trying to sort out pointless arguments. I don't want to expose this person, but I remember someone once put a thick book about modesty in my hand, and he said, that's for you. And I said, thank you, sir. And then he said, that'll be $27. <laughs> I said, sir, I don't want it if that's the case. Uh -huh. <laughs> we often get caught up on pointless arguments and the only solution to these pointless arguments is for you to actually look up. You ever want to solve a problem and settle an issue, so you go onto Google and you what? You look it up to find the answer. And so the same solution applies here. The solution to your pointless arguments is to go and look up. Look up where? Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are where? where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are what? 
not on things that are on where? We should look up. Set your minds on what? Not on all these pointless arguments. And in case I didn't make it clear enough, we must keep our eyes on who? Who leads us and makes our faith complete. He endured the shame of being nailed to a cross because he knew later on he would be glad he did. Now he is seated at the right side of God's throne. So keep your mind on who? Who put up with many insults from sinners. Then you won't get discouraged and give up. If you keep your mind on Jesus, we must look to Jesus, not to the things of earth. If you keep your focus on Him, you will endure. The point of the Gospel is not all the pointless arguments. The point of the Gospel is that as stewards of God's grace, we should be turning people's attention to who? To Jesus. Professed Christians keep altogether too near to the lowlands of earth. Their eyes are trained to see only commonplace things, and their minds dwell upon the things their eyes behold. Their religious experience is often what? And unsatisfying, and their words are what? So if you get caught up on things of earth, all of your conversation is light and valueless. I don't want you to waste my time with any of your pointless arguments about the things on earth. How can such reflect the image of Christ? How can they send forth the bright beams of the sun of righteousness into all the dark places of the earth? To be a Christian is to be what? We were called to go and shine the light in this what? Dark world. And how will we shine light in this dark world? Christians are called to be Christ-like. And so if your argument has anything to do with anything else other than Christ, I don't want anything to do with you. Whoever says he abides in him ought to what? in the same way in which he walked. I want you to understand, we must look to Jesus or will what? So you recognize one of the reasons that churches fail at their mission is because they're not focused on Jesus. They're focused on anything but Jesus. And the moment we've gotten off track from following Jesus, we are going into the darkness. But you see, when your focus is on Jesus, then you remove all of the pointless arguments. You remove all of the, the debate and the bickering and the disputes and the unnecessary typing, all of the comments on videos and on websites and on Facebook arguing about posts. Because you see, when you boil it down and strip it from all of that nonsense, this is what true religion is. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To what? Visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So you see, if you strip religion of all of its pointless arguments, it actually will serve a beautiful purpose. What is pure religion? Did you notice what James has just said? True religion is to help those deprived of family. And so you see, I'm hoping that I'm making it clear how this all comes full circle. God gave responsibility to the first what? To the first family so that they might be stewards of His creation. And you, if you receive the gift, are a steward too of God's grace in your life. And you, as a steward, 
need to stop wasting your time on all the pointless arguments and get back to God's true religion, which is to help those deprived of family. Because I want to go back to the story of Adam and Eve. Why did God give Eve to Adam? God gave Adam the responsibility. He put him in the garden to tend and what? But then God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good to be alone. God gave us family to help us be the stewards of His creation. God gave us family so that we might accomplish the purpose He created us for. See, the good news is, as I said at the start, I will say it again, we are part of the family. And so what does that mean, that we are part of the family? Turn with me to Elijah's message in Malachi chapter 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of what? Fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. I want you to see how this all ties in, so write this last great truth. The remnant work for the restoration of the what? The remnant are defined by their mission to go into this corrupted world and shine the light in the darkness. And to shine the light is to bring the good news that you too can be a part of the family. Do you understand just how significant the family is for our work? We've got some real, real, real good news. That God has given us the chance to be a part of the family. And if you've accepted that you are part of the family, you have the responsibility to go and let others know that they too can be part of the family. Family is the means to accomplish the mission, and the mission is to go and create more family. Go and let others know that they too can be a part of the family of God. Now, I will be completely honest that I have boiled this down to the bare bones. Christian ethics is indeed a whole lot more, but the fact is, I am not here to proclaim to you a bunch of pointless arguments. I'm here to claim to you the basic fact that you too can be a part of the family. You can be a part of the family because God has come so that you can be covered by the blood. Church family, it's really not that complicated. God has given us the means to actually go and share the message. He's called each one of us to be stewards of what He's actually given to us. He's called each one of us to bear our responsibility and go and share the good news. The good news that you are part of the family. That is some very, very, very good news. And if you don't learn to accept and appreciate the good news, then guess what? You've lost your focus on Jesus. We need to come again and appreciate that the purpose of the gospel is to point people to the cross, to point people to Jesus, to let them know that there is good news. Church family, I'm not here to proclaim something complicated. I'm here to preach the cross and the cross alone, Christ crucified for you. That is good, good news. Now, I'll be honest, Pastor, I, I don't know how to end this other than to simply say we've got good news. We should be sharing the good news.
I'm going home to see my Savior. I am going home to sit at the welcome table and enjoy a meal together as a family. I can't wait for the day when he comes back and we all get to be at the welcome table as one big happy family. So if you want to be a part of the family, church family, you're invited. Every single person is invited to be a part of the family. And if you feel that you are, and happily so, part of the family, then I invite you, let somebody you know be invited as well. Because no one should be deprived from a seat at the table. If you want to be at the welcome table, stand with me. I will pray once more that we might be at the welcome table and invite others to join us there. Dear Lord, God, often we get distracted by the pointless issues of life and forget the very good news that we are a part of the family and that we will be at the welcome table together with you at the wedding supper of the Lamb the Lamb who shed His blood for us. And Lord, I pray that this might actually do something in our lives, that knowing this truth may convict us to go and share this truth. You've called each one of us to a responsibility. You have poured Your grace into our lives, and we have been called to be stewards of God's grace. So may we actually bear up the responsibility you've given to go and accomplish the mission and let others know that they can be a part of the family. What very, very good news. I pray that we might share the good news in your most holy and precious name. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.